everyone welcome back to jocelyn's art corner i'm jocelyn torres i'm your host and the person that is you know conducting all these interviews and as part of craft uh we would like to wish you a very happy new year we're in full swing already and um we have all these exciting and wonderful things happening this year so stay tuned if you follow us on social media stay tuned for all those things that we'll be sharing uh we kind of slowed down on posting and stuff it you know the holidays are always very hectic but i hope your holidays were safely spent with family and uh, thank you again for being here so today i'm going to have uh an artist she's a visual artist from palm view texas that's here in the valley um her name is alejandra martinez she graduated recently from the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. It's very exciting to have her today. She will be having a solo exhibit at Carla Hughes in uh, Harlingen, Texas. So I hope that you enjoy this talk that we're going to have today. So stick around. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. I'm here with our guest. She's an artist, and her name is Alejandra Martinez. Alejandra, thank you so much for being thank here. You for having me. It's a pleasure to have you, and I know you're driving from Palmview to be yes. here, so <laughs> it's really awesome. And like I said, you guys, this is our first interview for the year, and I'm very, very excited. So we're going to get right to it. I know in, in the artist bio, you mentioned that you were born in Mission. Mm -hmm. you, were you raised there too? I was raised in Palmview, so it's a neighboring city. Okay. Uh, Mission is basically five minutes away from Palmview, but I was born in Mission and raised in Palmview. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, it's crazy because I've been in the valley, but I've mostly just been in Brownsville, and it's rare that I get out to like the upper valley. Yeah, really so I don't know that much about like our neighboring cities. Like up there. I'm the same way. Honestly, <laughs> that's why like I cherish coming all the way over yeah. here because it's. My whole life, like I just know the Hidalgo County, so it's it's nice whenever I get to venture yeah. out to like See, other places. Now you're in Cameron County. See, <laughs> no, yeah, it's nice. Like I don't know, I guess it's just more tropical in a sense. Comes back, like it's yeah. closer to the like beach area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I cherish it. For sure. It reminds me of that. It's really nice. Um, but the whole valley is really nice. There's a lot to be appreciated. So Alejandra, um, when did your interest in art begin? Did this start at a very young age? Or? Well, I've always had an interest in art I guess naturally children have the tendency to grab a crayon and draw uh, but and usually this kind of overlaps with other artists mm -hmm. um, the school district offers art classes and you kind of get exposure to art and materials uh, whenever you're like in middle school or at least it was for me I took a theater arts class and that's where I kind of became interested in like the performance aspect of art and then I kind of switched over to like a arts or like plastic art mm -hmm. that's where I started realizing well I think I like this a little bit better yeah. but it was around that time when I was about maybe like 12 or 13 years old yeah around that age that's so interesting that you mentioned like theater and stuff because yeah. like it goes hand in hand because with theater there's also elements of like you know like the visual like it's so important like yeah. you know the makeup and props yeah, no and like setting the scene and stuff so and then I know that you've had like this this ongoing theme recently que se pones tu payasín makeup yes, yeah. you know <laughs> the theater actually yes. in a way it was almost accidental. I don't think it was necessarily like a thing that I was thinking of when mm -hmm. I started doing it. It was just kind of like a, a coincidence in a way because I, I started a while back with makeup, just wearing makeup. I didn't wear makeup at all, like all my adolescence. Mm -hmm. And then I started buying cosmetics and I started seeing people who didn't necessarily identify as like female mm -hmm. start wearing it. And I was like, well, you know what? Because at the time I was kind of, questioning that part of myself as an artist and as a person and I thought well maybe I could wear it too and, and I would always go extreme like I would always think like oh I can kind of do like drag makeup or I can do mm -hmm. kind of like in a way not necessarily like an everyday thing so I would always do that but I wouldn't ever post it online or anything yeah. like that but then when I started like getting recognition online for my art like I was just like you know what screw it like I'm just gonna <laughs> post it too like it's just part yeah. of me too like you have other interests that are necessary like drawing or painting mm -hmm. and then I saw like a response to it so I kept on doing it but it was only an online thing mm -hmm. and it wasn't until I had that show with uh, 
it was with other artists. It was the um, Orange Valley show mm -hmm. that Ramiro put together in Tropicasa that I decided, you know what, I'm going to bring this to like a performance aspect too. And again, like quoting kind of like theater, I guess. Yeah. I was like, I, I want to be that person that is associated with this kind of ongoing performance of giving people kind of like a mask, I guess. Um, because again, the makeup had nothing to do with like the, with the drawings mm -hmm. or anything like that. But it was more so like a, like an eye catcher kind of thing or like wanting to get that attention from, hey, like there's, there's this like person that looks way different from her. And I was like, there must be something going on here. So mm -hmm. it's just kind of like a, like again, like playing with the public and I guess their perception of me mm -hmm. and, you know, I just like artistic ones. Their perception changes, like you're out there, but it's like a persona. Like, yeah, they're seeing you, but they're seeing a certain aspect of you. Yeah, and yeah, and I guess in a way you're right. Like, you're trying to give an illusion of who you are, mm -hmm. and not so much. I guess at that point, I kind of wanted people to approach me like that, like an artist, not so much myself. Because when you wear like that type of makeup, sometimes it's hard to like concentrate on the fact that you're with that person. You're just thinking like you're looking at them. Yeah. And it's kind of hard <laughs> to like sometimes focus on like who they are. So. In a way, it's like distracting. You're like, oh, I really like your makeup, and the conversation kind of shifts yeah. from like the. In a way, I I see it. It's like. It catches people's attention, mm -hmm. but it's also a way to grant privacy to the person because they're so focused on the character, and you as a person, it's not so much like they're acknowledging Alec, Alejandra. It's more mm -hmm. like at that point, I was like four four water ladies. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. It's like a different type of um. A different type of uh, identity or persona like yeah that. because then the handles and stuff like yeah when you start building a following and then you get out there like in person and you're interact you're interacting and then someone comes across you that follows you oh you're 44 water yeah like, oh not oh you're Alejandra I mean you you might hear that right but you'll hear a lot like oh you're 44 water lilies or you're violet gypsy you're, that's my yeah. handle right and even like like the way that artists are signing their artwork now also true with their handle not just their name that's kind of like part of who you are you're not just you you're also like who you are virtually yeah you're a virtual presence and that manifests that can manifest yeah. in like our reality and stuff like face to face like. i mean it's because most of like my success i attribute to the online presence mm -hmm. like the whole reason why i feel <clears throat> now there's a uh, some sort of attention towards my work i i have to say that it's because of the online presence because when mm -hmm. i was a student i didn't really have that much of an outspoken presence like in person yeah and when the pandemic hit everything turned virtual so then i you know, and it usually happens with like digital spaces that you feel like you can be more vulnerable because mm -hmm. you can't really see people's reactions. It's like, like a safe you, space. Yeah, in a way, yeah. because you post something and you're not there looking at the people's reaction. So I felt more vulnerable to just post everything that I would do. Mm -hmm. And then that's when people started. I mean, I have to like thank Ramiro for out in the night of six. He was the one who kind of, you know, took me around and said, hey, like, I really like your work. And mm -hmm. other people start sharing it. So then 44 Waterleaf becomes this kind of like online presence or like a yeah. brand. Whereas my fine art kind of is kind of in the past and I'm trying to like bring it back. So yeah. living both digitally and in person. So. Yeah. Okay, so we're talking right now like about identity, like digital presence and stuff. So I want to get into your actual artwork that you do. Like what, what are some themes that your artwork covers or explores? So initially, when I started my artwork, and I mean like the plastic artist, plastic art aspect of mm -hmm. um, of my work, it started with me being obsessed with philosophy a lot. So I guess coming into the art school or whatever when I was in university, I considered myself like a loner. I was always by myself. I didn't really have a lot of friends. I don't even think no, I didn't, I didn't have any friends like Thank at you. all. <laughs> And that was just the way that I was all throughout high school. So it just became, like you said, like part of my identity. Mm -hmm. So I would read a lot of books and usually the homework that they would assign for philosophy, I would kind of be that student that would go like above and beyond and like listen to podcasts and look mm -hmm. at videos. 
and naturally when I started getting to art classes and you know usually in art school they ask you for some sort of artist statement so that you can build up your portfolio and they kind of guide you in that way mm -hmm. naturally for me the way to start was to kind of grasp uh, okay what am I going to do with my since I was doing painting at the time I think I was also doing drawing mm -hmm. I thought okay what can I get that interests me that I can talk about a lot that I can paint about a lot and I liked existentialism so some of the topics would include existentialism I would talk a lot about since I was going through um, a, a hard time I would talk about hardships and, and I wanted to also quote like uh, writers that I liked like Albert Camus or what, Jorge Luis Borges and I, I just liked getting into like the past that I had already established myself of investigating all the time by myself right. and now kind of shifting into the like visual arts okay so now that I know this how can I use these themes of like I said like hardships um, punishment was another one I really liked like Greek mythology so mm -hmm. I wanted to kind of in a way express how I used to feel that loneliness or like that kind of also solitude of, of myself as an artist mm -hmm. not just myself as like a person but also like in my classes and a lot of nihilistic thought too which mm -hmm. is something that I kind of now I look back and I was like wow I was really like in a way I, I had something against the world I guess mm -hmm. but again like I attribute it to my youth too um, when you're in college you kind of think everything is like this grandiose thing or like that everybody's against you or mm -hmm. or maybe it's just me right paying too much attention to things but um when i started i i really wanted to to create a long lasting piece even though i was an undergrad i i wanted to create something very meaningful and i attribute my my inspiration to that book i, I always mention it and, and honestly it's kind of weird because i haven't actually thought about how much it it really impacted me and I don't necessarily mean it like in a positive sense. It was, mm -hmm. I think that I became too obsessed with that book to the point where like, I wasn't realizing how much I didn't understand it at the point. I'm talking about The Myth of Sisyphus by Albert Camus. Mm -hmm. It's a book that talks about, in a way, what do you do when you realize that everyday mundane things can kind of unravel and you realize that why do we do things or why do we, like for example like why am I doing this interview or why do I wake up every day and then hope that my art gets old or, or when I was a student I used to think well why do I come to school or and it became an obsession of well you know maybe the first thing that you can feel is that you probably don't belong in this world or so again it kind of you can either go either way you can say mm -hmm like Kamu says well you know you should just appreciate the fact that everything is absurd and you should just um, do what you like and enjoy the mundane earthly things or you can live a life of just questioning all the time and at the time I didn't understand the book because again I was like probably 20 19 years old and I thought oh well, it just means like then I should just hyper fixate on everything and you know yes everything's absurd so then why try when in reality it's, well, everything's absurd, then I should just do whatever I want. Like, I can be an artist, even if it's hard. Um, but those are just, like, some of the themes that, like, really inspired my work when I began. Yeah. It's not an easy subject matter. Yeah. Like, and I don't think just anyone could, like, sit down and actually read a heavy piece of philosophy like that. Or just philosophy in general, yeah. you know, like, <laughs> you know what I mean? But I think when you enjoy something, like... You're gonna have that one book that was like, oh, that was the yeah. one book that really influenced me. Or so it's very interesting to hear like how how that how that influenced your work. You know what I mean? So because it's not always gonna be like necessarily other artists. Sometimes it'll be movements or literature or films and stuff. Which is, I mean, I was gonna ask you that also, like, you know, what what influenced your work? But I mean, it goes hand in hand. Is this theme still like present in your work currently i think are these things like existentialism or the absurd or you know like i said it's it was what kind of started it but i don't mm -hmm. think it's present okay. all throughout because what happened after i made the series is that i realized that i was creating like a visual vocabulary for myself mm -hmm. Um, because again, like you say, and that's a good thing that you bring that up, like it's not an easy topic to just bring to the table. Like, and I, I realized that very, 
uh, quickly when I was in classes where I guess since when you're alone you kind of have um, these kind of conversations with yourself and of course you kind of get yourself all the time but when it's time to speak to other people, you know, you start realizing people don't actually think about these things or they don't, they don't care, you know, okay, whatever, like, it's fine. Um, but when I started creating this series or this body of work, I realized mm -hmm. that I wanted to portray it in a way that it was not so obvious. And I guess the reason was because I wanted to challenge myself into creating, like I said, like a visual vocabulary for mm -hmm. what each thing meant. Because I thought that if I I painted what I wanted to initially, which again could be like some sort of image of like, uh, since I mentioned like the metaphor of everyday things, well, I could maybe paint like some cars that are going to the, to like somebody's employment, right? Somebody's going to their job, or mm -hmm. somebody like maybe this image of like a lot of people crossing by in the city or something like that. But I wanted to make it personal to myself, and I wanted to make it symbolic. And like you said, is it like that now, my artwork? Well, I think because I started doing symbols, I just kind of became obsessed now with finding a way to find a metaphor or some sort of image that relates to that idea that I want to portray. Um, my work just kind of became like this world that I created for myself yeah. and how I understand the outside world, I guess. That you've created this little world, like that's that's you like you have your distinct style your vocabulary and there's a lot of there's a lot of symbolism like I would compare your work to like like surrealism or metaphysical artwork you know and so kind of like if you're having a dream sort of thing mm -hmm. like like little symbols like animalitos like little animals or like you know the lily pads you know, the beetles and stuff and this just very vivid imagery like what you would find in a the tarot deck like you know if you're into tarot cards and stuff um i don't know so i, I feel i feel like you do have like your own style it's evolved into this whole other thing and it's going to keep evolving it's, how about like other artists are there other artists that you can credit to like you know like, oh yeah that have inspired sure. your work for sure i think and i was just thinking about that on the drive over here I was thinking that I wanted so badly at first to paint exactly like the surrealist. I don't know, I guess, like you said, something about the, the dreamlike quality or like the subconscious mind aspect of right. it, like drew me in. Um, I always wanted to paint like Magritte mm -hmm. because in a sense they were juxtaposed objects that had nothing to do with each other, yeah. but because of the the scale of the way that it was painted, it was painted almost like a realistic image, but mm -hmm. I guess what was disturbing in the image is the fact that there's objects that shouldn't necessarily be next to each other. <laughs> Magritte is one of them, Giorgio Quirico was one of my biggest inspirations, mm -hmm. the father of metaphysical art. Um, I don't know how much Dali took a toll on me or not, because I always mention, I think I mentioned somewhere else that the first time that I was uh, that I perceived the Dali painting, I was in a uh, nurse's office in middle school. Like, that was the first time I saw oh, that wow. painting. And I, I remember, like, I said in another to me, like, I had uh, hurt my foot. Mm -hmm. And, like, one of the nurses never came. And I was just looking at it, like, because, like, whenever you, you like, your eyes naturally yeah, were drawn to the part. <laughs> and I was just looking at it, and I was like, I hate that painting so much. Because oh, wow. I was in pain, and I was like, it's so <laughs> ugly, like... And I I learned to appreciate it later on, but I was like, yeah. it's just so ugly, like, why is there, like, ants and, like, this tree and, like, this nose-looking thing? I, was just, I hated it so much. And, of course, there's this sense of pain, but also, in a sense, and I, I attribute this to, like, to Freud. <clears throat> like, there's, there's there's this almost sense of pleasure that comes from the disturb the disturbing things of life. So, I think surrealism is one of those things that kind of drew me in because of that because it was beautiful but it was disturbing at the right. same time yeah i mean i was really into collage initially but i'm not too sure if i can attribute one artist that i was mm -hmm. inspired with but i really liked i guess over the times of like the 1920s um, and which is mm -hmm. kind of interesting that like 100 years now i'm trying to like i guess relive that or not really but kind of go back in time and study what happened 100 years ago and kind of bring a new light into it i think Maybe, I think it's time for surrealism to die. I think it's a little obsolete. It was great in its time because it was right. revolutionary, but you know, it's some, like Madrid did something revolutionary, but you can do it in like 
Photoshop now. You can do it. Like yeah. it's something that it was revolutionary in its time mm-hmm. because it was something that in a time back then, you know, painting was this kind of sense of like academic style or maybe right. and now like playing around with weird things. <clears throat> it was revolutionary. It was outrageous. Yeah. I mean, people were like, were reacting like very like, <laughs> yeah. oh my God, no, because this is not the academic way or this yeah. is not like, it's unacceptable. So definitely, and like bringing that, like, you know, those influences into like a um, a contemporary context, exactly. you know, for me, it's like synthesizing like those influences, like, you know, whether it be like artists and stuff um, or literature. And synthesizing these different ideas into the present, you know, and and it's up to you to interpret that. So it's like you're the Photoshop, you know, mm-hmm. like you have that that program integrated, and you can like you know execute those images the way that you see them in your mind's eye, you know. Yeah, I guess I agree with that too because like I mentioned, my beginnings with collage, it's very much that like mm-hmm. you get a magazine and you look through yeah. the things that you want, you pick and choose, you that you make a, a judgment of their this is good this is not and then you create like the masterpieces mm-hmm. i want to segue into your show so alejandra is actually having an exhibit and this is at carla hughes yeah. right carla in harlingen let's talk about that a little bit like um did you have pieces ready or did you like prepare do a lot of like preparation for this exhibit uh no everything that i have all the body of work was completed either two years back or Mm -hmm. three years back. Actually, everything consists of uh, paintings done in oil. So the whole show is uh, featuring oil paintings. And again, it it features this theme that I'm talking about, like the work that I did as an undergrad, some of the things that I did while graduating, and some of the new things that I made during uh, the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And usually everything is a large body of work. It's usually like 30 by 40, which Mm -hmm. I used to be very i guess i don't know how to explain it but i used to think that that was large until like i started going to galleries and i'm like that is not large but it's yeah. large when you think about being an undergrad and paintings are due every week mm-hmm. then it becomes yeah hard <laughs> yeah for sure <laughs> i honestly i don't even know how i finished it i i don't think that i was the one who painted it at the time i think it was just out of desperation of just like i had to have this image and I think I was just too hard on myself too as an undergrad. I don't know why, but mm-hmm. I put such a high standard for myself. Um, I, like I look back, I think about that person because I don't even identify with that same person anymore when I think about like the experiences that I had. But mm-hmm. I was so preoccupied with like making this statement, I guess. I wanted my work to speak for myself. Hopefully it still does, but I don't think that's the case anymore. Like I think I was just trying to prove myself to just myself I guess I don't know. yeah I mean it's but it's good because you had standards you know you weren't just like man no <laughs> well, there's I mean you'll come across a lot of people like that but I think the ones that truly care are actually like the people that are like the most like no yeah I I thought know. I was gonna like I was putting my own show together and then come to think of it I never actually had an under that show <laughs> like I was yeah. putting together this body of work like uh, I would write poems and I would try to accommodate like the painting to the poem and revisit and do all of these editing and and then like to me I was like oh, so I'm gonna have my BFA show and it never happened like it was just like an online website so that, yeah I have, all that <laughs> or I have the same finished. experience for like okay when did you graduate I graduated uh last May so in 2021 last May okay that's a whole nother story because I am an artist by accident because I wanted to be an art teacher. I was in that path, art education. Mm-hmm. Art education. I almost got my license until other things happened, but mm-hmm. I was in that path already. I was like, you know what? No, the artist life is not for me. Like, I'm going to be a teacher and work in public education. And then I realized that was not the case for me. <laughs> so it went the other way. Yeah, and it's <laughs> like I, I was so dedicated as an undergrad. I think more than the studio majors mm-hmm. and I was over here being an art major thinking art ed major thinking like oh I'm you know doing all of these things and I can also be a teacher and, and then I realized wait like after I graduated like after some complications and just life happens mm-hmm. I was like I think I was always meant to be like an artist and how poetic that sounds but I think I always had that drive regardless whether I wanted to do teaching or mm-hmm. anything else and it just happened accidentally I guess and 
now we're here. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm glad that we're here right now <laughs> having this conversation. People ask you, what are you studying? Oh, I'm studying art. Oh, I didn't do that. Like, you know, like people don't take what that. What happens after you graduate? People don't take that seriously as a career. And it's like, you can do things with it, but it's like, you know, so hold on. Yeah, so. And talking about like, okay, what are you going to do with that? I know that you've also been doing a lot of like community events, like, mm-hmm. uh, like uh, being a vendor and stuff. Yeah. So how is that going for you? My entrepreneurship. Yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, it's actually been pretty successful. Um, again, that happened almost accident. I think everything in my career <laughs> is going to happen just or because. Or was it by accident? Right. I think, <laughs> I think it was just that I was in the right time at the right right place okay. at the right time. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, with the vending, it's actually been really nice because I get to finally do what I've been wanting to do, which is getting into the community. Mm -hmm. Uh, When I was an undergrad, it was very much school, home, school, home. And I didn't really allow myself to actually get into the community and know other artists or like other people who were interested in art or in music. Um, But it's been nice because I get to meet people who, again, that online presence and the the in-person presence is very different because Mm -hmm. I think there's a misconception about me that like I'm very always there and I'm Mm -hmm. always trying to like post things I guess I come across as very um like the opposite of introvert I forget right now extrovert extrovert there Mm -hmm. you go like I feel like I come off as a person who's like talking to everyone or like going to all the events and and naturally I'm very introverted but I force myself out of you know the interest of getting into community I kind of in a way try to you know to talk to people that i wouldn't otherwise do if i wasn't a vendor and just being a vendor also is cool because people come to your table so you don't really feel like you have to like approach people because people are like hey like i remember you like (laughs) i see your stuff or or it's even really cool when like you're like vending and people are like hey like i'm interested in this or oh yeah i'll follow you and then i've met many of my friends that way where like some of my clients i now become friends with because like they discover my art and then it's like hey like I really like what you do and yeah. you're really cool but but yeah it's been actually really nice I've done it since um since August of last year and again it was accidental because somebody reached out to me one of the <laughs> organizers and like hey like we're putting together a show like we we do this almost all the time like do you want to come and I'm like I mean I don't have a table but I'm gonna find one <laughs> like, I don't know how, but, but my lovely friend Maris, she um she shared the table with me and we were just there the whole time and I didn't even have business cards we were like hey like you know what do you do like where can you find you and I'm like I remember this one instance he was like do you have a business card and I'm like no and I didn't have a pen or they just my work and my my cash and stuff and I was like no but I can like like I can oh because in one of my work it had my app because like I don't have my phone I was like I was like I'm sorry so then those little experiences made me like become a better vendor and like more um, experience just led me to know other people and I was like okay I have to think about every interaction and like the way that I present my art and myself and but it's been nice it's good practice for getting out there I guess yeah you just have to be prepared yes I mean, once you're putting yourself out there as an artist, you're an entrepreneur, you're your own business and you're representing yourself. Mm-hmm. And so it's very important to be prepared. Um, even if you're not the best at talking to people, sometimes like your work will speak for you and then the conversations will just develop naturally. Yeah. You know? But I mean, it's good because I've seen your setup. It's super <laughs> cute, your little keychains and the way you hang them and stuff, stickers, toda la cosa. I think it's great also like to be part of the community that way you can network and you can oh, yeah, for sure. you know like and then that's where more more doors more opportunities open you know it's not just like the idea of like the artist being isolated in their studio no for and sure stuff, because you, know? you say that and I'm thinking like <clears throat> most of the opportunities that I've had are because I talk to the people while I'm vending or like other vendors which are super lovely like I've never met a vendor that hasn't made me feel like uncomfortable or anything like Mm -hmm. usually I meet other people and then something pops up like hey like would you want to do this and it's like hey and then now you start like expanding your bubble in a way because for me my whole life like I said it was just Palm View, Mission, Mm -hmm. like all of that right and I wouldn't really know other artists but then you get out there to like McAllen like the art events and then Sometimes maybe like I've done events in Harlingen, so then the bubble opens even more there. And then hey, like I saw your stuff, and like you say, you start networking. It's a really cool experience because you get to know other people that have the same passion for you, 
that you wouldn't otherwise see if, if you were just in your room drawing all day. Yeah, so. yeah. I asked you previously if you wanted to talk about a piece in particular, and you mentioned the realization. Yes. Uh, so would you want to get a little bit into that piece? Like, you know, what would you like to say about it? So I think that piece is very symbolic in the series that I'm presenting at the at the solo show, just because. Even though I consider it to be the second part of the body of work, so there's like, you know, they actually go in series like one, two, three, or like in mm -hmm. phases or in stages. I think that one is the one that always seems to strike people, um, especially when I've had them, because again, I presented this painting along some other ones about two or three times, and I've, but I've never actually had to have the full body work, but this painting always strikes people, and I think it's just, the way that it's painted because again I, I managed to get some sort of like uh, skill of realism in there but also just the, the subject matter so the subject matter is uh, it's like a bucket and you have this kind of mirror that's placed on top so the mirror acts as both the like the actual mirror aspect mm -hmm. the reflection but it also acts like water there's a paper bolt and there's like this lightning bolt striking like the lightning bolt and the bucket but you notice it's against a red background and they're like mm -hmm. this kind of uh, round surface and it's uh, it's a spilling water right it has mm -hmm. like little holes and it's like spilling water so it's a very weird uh, looking painting right otherwise it wouldn't exist anywhere else um, and when I was putting it together I, I can't tell you exactly how I came up with that um, juxtaposition I don't remember again I have a lot of notes but mm -hmm. I think that one in particular I attribute to this poem that I was writing, this kind of whole script that I had. The reason why I find that painting to be very symbolic to me is because that painting was the part of the of the of the poem that I explained that I realized that my life had no meaning. And again, it's very poetic because at that time I actually felt like I didn't know what I wanted to do. Like regardless that I was an art student, I realized like, I don't know if this is gonna get me success in any way. I don't know if what I'm doing is correct. Um, and I had the support of other people like my parents or my family, but I always felt like I was doing something wrong or like that I wasn't understanding why I was not happy with my decisions to be an artist or an art teacher. And um, I always felt like I was alone or like that I wasn't like in this kind of paper bowl, like I, I always use the paper bowl as a symbolism or a symbol uh, mm -hmm. for mental health um, because I always attribute it to like a suicide note or like a love note. Again, the visual vocabulary depends on the context in my work. Mm -hmm. And again, that bucket is, is to me the most tragic part of the painting because it's useless or at least I intended it to be useless. I myself, like I found myself to be useless at that time. Even though like I thought like I paint so well, like I must be useful for, for this, right? Or for other things. But um, there was a time that I felt like anything that I did was not good enough or that anything that I thought was like subpar. And I just expressed it that way, like the, the tearings of the, I mean, the water that streams, like I also thought of it like whenever it just bursts into tears and you just, realize like I don't know what to do like it's just the, like the yeah. breaking point or like the strike is just right. and um, I did an investigation of my own body of work later on I wrote a this uh, what was it I forgot uh, this thesis statement for one of my classes mm -hmm. and I found this painting by an artist one of the pre raphaelites that I really like uh, John William Waterhouse mm -hmm. and he had a painting well he paints a lot of uh, images from like literature and he had this painting called the, the Danates, I believe. Mm -hmm. And if you know about Greek mythology, the Danates were that uh, like series of uh, women, they were all sisters, that were forced to marry their other identical, like by number brothers. And they agreed for some weird reason in Greek mythology, don't ask me why, <laughs> that they should marry each other. So it's like intense weirdness in yeah. Greek mythology. <laughs> um, uh, obviously the girls, the women were like, we're not going to do that. Like there was some sort of logic there, I guess. And then because they didn't marry their, um, their husbands and decided to murder them one by one, they were of course punished by the gods. And, um, what ended up happening was that their punishment, you know, this is the, the key part of what I'm talking about. 
Their punishment was that they had to fill up a vessel with mm -hmm. water. But it was an eternal punishment, again, like kind of for the themes, because mm -hmm. the vessel had a hole in the bottom. So it was always, like you always had to be so filled. No matter how much you filled it, it would never. It would always fill. Yeah. Exactly. And I always thought it was like, it's very similar to the other one, the mm -hmm. bucket. No matter how much you put it, it's useless. It doesn't work just like that vessel. Yeah. And it was interesting because one could say that I was inspired by that painting. But what happened was that I, I usually was inspired by like the things that I would write mm -hmm. and then later on I would find different things that related to oh, my work. that always happens. Yeah. I, mean, I like to think of it as like a cosmic connection yeah, or something. It feels pretty nice because you think people are also talking about this even if it's been years back like mm -hmm. other people probably felt this way and again of course the Greek mythology thing might not be specific to my case mm -hmm. but you know the imagery of, of feeling like you're doing something that's um, troublesome or that there's some sort of punishment like again like well the punishment of just existing like why do I have to do this and there, it's been there like in art history like if you revisit it yeah all those themes have always been there it's just that you have to go and look for it and it, it either inspires you or like we said like you find it by accident mm -hmm. but it's it's mm -hmm. nice I don't know that's getting very profound into like you know, like the psyche of an artist or just, uh, you know, existence in general and that, or the problem of existence and yeah. that painting that you're describing. The human condition. Right, the human condition, exactly. <laughs> because, I mean, who hasn't felt like that? Like, oh, at, you reach a certain point where you think or you feel like, oh, this is useless. What's the point of anything? Like, I know that I have felt that way many times. And, um, I mean, I was talking to a friend of mine recently and, and they said something like, I mean, even like existing can be, can be exhausting. Yeah. I know you mentioned also this word perseverance. And I think that's also like a very important theme in your work too. It's just that despite those, uh, challenges or circumstances, there's always that hope, you know, of like just persevering and pushing through obstacles you know what I mean mm -hmm. and coming out the other side it's like in the end it's still a very positive message and oh, I think you put it perfectly then yeah that's very true yeah and going back to the book about the myth of Sisyphus Sisyphus also kind of became an icon that I used a lot and not so much I mean Sisyphus was again like in Greek mythology he was that king who King of Cretheus, I think, I can't remember, but mm -hmm. it was something along those lines where he was punished for cheating death and he, his punishment was to like roll up a mm -hmm. boulder, you know, and you know, for eternity. And I kind of attribute it to like a, a dung beetle kind of doing the same thing, okay. kind of pushing the dung. <laughs> yeah. And I, I kind of connected those things and like obviously I credit that from other people giving me influences, but mm -hmm. I take and, and I mix around and and I feel like, you know, one can say, one can look like a, that little beetle that's, you know, pushing the dung and around, it's like it's, it's, you know, it can crush it or it's so small. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and sometimes we don't start to think that that beetle has a purpose and we think that it might be pointless for that beetle to, you know, to push things around like it's basically, you know, uh, excrement. But to that beetle, that thing that they're pushing around, it's, you know, it's going to be the the center where they can, you know, give birth to other beetles and, mm -hmm. and then their own community. Well, that's, you know, they have a point and a purpose, but to other people, it might seem uh, pointless. It might seem like well, what they're punished to have to roll that every single day, you know, just to have some sort of decent life of a beetle. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting too specific, but I, I think what I mean to say is I kind of felt like that too. Um, mm -hmm. Kind of again, going back to like Kafka. Uh, with that book, the metamorphosis, the metamorphosis. So you kind yeah. of feel, even though that takes another route again, but mm -hmm. feeling like some useless thing, or not useless, more like a disturbing kind of presence yeah. to, to society. Right, yeah. You bring up the, the myth of Sisyphus, Bella. and um, I remember in undergrad, it was one of the professors in, in the Edinburgh campus, mm -hmm. Paul Valadez. Um, he brought this up actually. He was trying to like get us like motivated to put the portfolio together and he wanted 40 images. Mm -hmm. And he says, 40 images, that might sound like a lot, but <laughs> you can do it. And I wanna 
I want to remind you of the myth of Sisyphus and this and that. Albert Camus. So this guy, he's rolling this this boulder up and it comes back down and he has to keep rolling it up and rolling it up. <laughs> and why? And he's suffering in all these things. But you know what? <laughs> Albert Camus says that he has a purpose. That his purpose is rolling that rock. So you as an artist, your rock is making an artwork. And when you're done with that one, you make another one. And when you're done <laughs> yeah. with that one, you make another one. And that's your purpose. That's your rock. And I was just like, damn. <laughs> <It's so true. laughs> I know. I was just like, wow. And so the, the last part of that book is like, you have to imagine him as a happy individual. And like, this is like, you have to imagine Sisyphus as, as being happy because. Mm -hmm. In the end, that's all you have. Like, maybe you don't become a successful artist. Like, let's say the most tragic thing that can happen is you make a lot of work, nobody sees it. So what? You have a body of work. Yeah. And you are yourself happy for it. Right. And it's hard as an artist because, I mean, all the opportunities come from the validation of the system, the community, the collectors, mm -hmm. the gallery owners. But, I mean, the worst thing that can happen is you never make it, but you learn something yourself and you help other people around you. But... <laughs> that's a good metaphor and a way to put it yeah, yeah that's true yeah it's i don't know i thought I, one i thought it was funny but it was also like very profound yeah so even if it's not in your lifetime because it has happened also where it's like an artist is unknown but then hundreds and hundreds of years later like their work is highly valued and collectible and you know they're in private collections or museums or, i don't know it can go many ways <laughs> um so to wrap it up you like you mentioned you were gonna do art education but then you're actually now an artist and you're selling your things and you're exhibiting so what would you say to someone that wanted to pursue art professionally or as an aspiring artist like, you know oh where do i start like is this something that i can really do is it worth it like what would you say to those people when I mention that I'm a painter, that I'm an artist, I specifically mean I'm a painter, to some degree I'm a poet and some sort of performer, but you know, it's really hard to be an artist nowadays uh, because there's a saturation of content online. And I'm just speaking about the way that I, you know, came about to be an artist was entirely from uh, a virtual presence. Uh, you post something and you hope that people see it and it's a thing of either people are going to see it and it's going to blow up or else it's just going to get um, put to the side. One of my, uh, a friend that I just made, he's a photographer, his name's uh, Joshua. He said something to me once in a market that made so much sense to me. And he said, you know, I think what you're doing just kind of in a way seems like you're like doing like a, one of those like scratch off things, the lottery tickets. And you're just buying so many of them to see like every event for me, every opportunity or when I post or when I'm engaging with an art artist, sometimes it's really hard to know what comes next. And I'm just trying to like find that opportunity and hope that I, you know, I get a jackpot because it's very uncertain. I don't think that I can compare this time for artists ever in art history. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much information we were supposed to see in our lifetime before yeah. like now we are consuming way too much yeah we know what's happening in other countries we know what's happening in our community we know i mean back then i wouldn't have known any other, any other artists if it wasn't for my phone i wouldn't have known of like these shows that are happening that some of them are very underground um but because of instagram you know those spaces you know those interests um there are those people that have the similar interests and I'm not going to say, you know, if there's a young viewer, I'm not going to say that this is easy because I don't consider myself in, in the system yet. And what I mean by the system is to the point where I know that I have collectors that want my work, to so right. the point where I know that I have, you know, friends who are gallery owners, that I have, you know, upcoming shows back to back. And that's when I know that I kind of have established yeah. myself. I'm barely trying to build a name for myself, build a name for my business, for my presence it's hard <laughs> it's very difficult because you have to have like this strategic way of you know staying true to what you like you know don't try to like do things just because other people like it of course you know focus on what you like you know if you're somebody like me that likes drawing or painting or digital media or just makeup be very consistent 
uh, with everything that you do because, you know, to build the skill because in the end, once the digital, because we don't know, maybe the digital age, um, for, yeah, they come to funcionar los phones tomorrow. <laughs> If you don't have a skill, it's going to be very hard for you to have some sort of recognition outside of social media. Um, but yeah, I mean, draw every day, even if it's something small, read something every day. Take the time to kind of reflect about why, and I mean just in the artistic sense. Mm -hmm. If you can, if you have the privilege of time too, because that's another big thing. This field, you know, some people are more privileged in opportunities than others, and it's a lot about like who you know. Um, you know, if your friend's a gallery owner, pues ahí está, ya le hiciste, y si vives allá, quién sabe dónde, I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, but it, it is very much about, you know, being very strategic. An artist is not somebody that you'll find, you know, in their studio all day painting. I mean, maybe, but if you really want to make it out there, especially in your life, you know, if you want to see that success, you really have to build a name for yourself, and that's networking unfortunately for introverts like I said it's, yeah, it's hard <laughs> but you'll make it because then people will find you and that's what's been happening to me people reach out to you and it feels amazing to be able to give some sort of commentary for what's going on either in our area or just in my work and and it feels validating but don't rely so much on validation of others because then you have nothing <laughs> you have to build a name for yourself build your work uh, build self-confidence and then you can go out there and say, you know, I, I have art too, you know, I can do this too. And I always, I'm always grateful for having the, the ability of having this as, you know, a reality because, you know, it's hard for people to access materials. Materials sometimes are very hard yeah. to get, you know, and I'm talking about like fine art because anything you can use to create art. But um, there's definitely some sort of hierarchy when it comes to art. Yeah, Just definitely. to be aware of that when you're young. Like yeah. don't think that if you don't have the most expensive pain of two, then you're not a good artist. Yeah. It's not about that. It's about having that um, that drive to create and think about why you want to do it or why you don't. You know, that's all. <laughs> uh, but for sure. Thank you so much. I think there's a lot of wisdom in those words <laughs> that you, should, you just shared with us. So I hope you all enjoyed this. Uh, thank you so much, Alejandra, oh, yeah, for being you. here. I really appreciate it. Yes, thank you so much for having thank me. You. Yes, thank you. Guys. And we'll see you guys next time. Take care. Bye-bye.